So thank you so much for having me. I've been a longtime fan of this conference and I'm delighted that I get to come the year that you're having it in Paris. So uh, one of the things we're interested in is what's the average class size in this school? There's three classrooms in this school. First classroom has one student, second classroom has three students, and the third classroom has five students. The average classroom size in this school is three students per class. That's correct if you ask the teachers. However, if you ask the students in this school, the average classroom size is four students per class. Both of these answers are mathematically correct. The average classroom is either three or four students, depending on who you ask. So this is a small, short, but really important introduction to the concept that the mathematics and the assumptions that are underlying your data viz make a really big difference in what kind of question you're answering. I learned this the hard way by, as Liz, Lynn mentioned, traveling uh, around the world, doing a lot of work in um, vulnerable communities, hard to reach communities, um, communities that aren't exposed to the kind of things that we get to talk about here. And figuring out that the questions and assumptions that we were making when we were producing research or data analysis or data viz are often not the same questions and assumptions that are being made by people who consume our data if they're not like us. So what is the average classroom size? It's not a specific enough question. The question you need to ask is, what is the classroom size according to whose point of view? This might seem like a little mathematical trick, but it's actually really important. Um, the relationship between average class size and academic performance is used frequently in many contexts. It's used by policymakers, it's used by governments, it's used by data journalists, and uh, it's used by um, everyday people look, trying to decide where to put their kids into school. So here's the relationship between the class size and the academic performance from a teacher's point of view in one school district where I was working. This is the same data, same school district, and this is the relationship between class size and academic performance from the student's point of view. So both of these trends are correct. So it's not true that one of them is correct and one of them is incorrect. They're both correct, but they're answering really different questions. One is saying, what's the relationship between classroom size and academic performance for a student? And the other is saying, what's the difference, what's the relationship between academic performance and classroom size for a student? Uh, so I'm going to talk today <clears throat> about a couple of fallacies. And uh, fallacies are often thought of as ways to do things wrong with math or ways to do things wrong with statistics. Um, but really, what I find is that most of the time, when somebody makes a mistake or uses a fallacy in their math, they're answering a question that's different than the question they think they're answering. And oftentimes the data we have can answer a question that's really, really close to the question that we want to answer. And often we like, emotionally, we like the answer that we get, and so we say, good enough, and we move on. So I'm gonna to talk today about a couple of the things that can go wrong when we present data that answers a question that's different. Um, for example, um, people have gone to jail when they, should, when they were innocent. Uh, people have died. Uh, governments make policies that aren't good for anybody and are not having the intended effect. And everyday citizens are given incorrect information. Uh, we're lucky enough to have, um, as the two speakers before me were talking, um, in the data design community, a really good emerging set of kind of best practices. Things you should and should not do with the design elements of your work to make sure that you're not accidentally misleading people. Uh, and when you're designing data, or telling a story with data, or making a chart with data, we need to work hand in hand and make sure that we are also relying on a set of best practices that prevents us from accidentally lying with the data. It's very easy to have a very well-designed chart that's meeting all the best data viz practices and principles, but accidentally is lying very beautifully. <laughs> so we're gonna take one example. Uh, is smoking cigarettes good for your health? 
So the horizontal axis is the average cigarette consumption for a country. And the vertical axis is life expectancy for a country. This is real data. We do a very, very basic statistical thing. We do a regression line. And we find out that, yes, indeed, cigarette smoking is highly uh, correlated or connected or has a relationship with uh, life expectancy in a country. In fact, we look at the coefficient and we find out that one extra cigarette adds 0 .0069 years to your life. That's confusing. Anybody that tells stories with data knows you can't say that. We do a little bit of transformation. Four cigarettes a day adds 10 years to your life. So this is real data. The math is correct. It is very, very statistically significant. If you're in the tribe of people that cares about p-values, you have a very low one. The problem here is not the math or the data viz. The problem is the title. The title is smoking cigarettes good for your health is misleading. The real title is do countries with higher average cigarette consumptions have longer life expectancies? And the answer is yes. So what this is called is the ecological fallacy. And this is really where I knew, wish I knew Sean and had the cuter, cuter frogs. <laughs> um, but so the ecological fallacy is where you try and answer a question using data that has a different level of analysis than the question you're trying to answer. So we were trying to answer a question about individuals. Is an individual's health going to be better or worse if the individual smokes? And the best data we could find was country-level data. So in countries where more people smoke, the life expectancy is higher. This is a very, very common problem, it, it, especially in the age of data privacy, unless you're working with the person that owns the data. Um, you are probably working with aggregate data. And then you have to make statements, oh, sorry, you have to make statements about that data at the level that you have the data. Now, a lot of you are probably, it's a very uh, advanced audience here, a lot of you are probably thinking, well, just because smoking is correlated with life expectancy doesn't mean anything. Correlation is not causation. We all know that. Some of us have it tattooed on us. Um, and we're not going to talk about that fallacy today. But there's a lot of other things that are also not causation, more than just correlation. And this is really important um, in the age of machine learning and AI. I know there's a lot of Google and Facebook type folks here. And the tools that work most frequently in AI situations are predictive tools. However, most of the time, if you're working with a policymaker or trying to figure out if your program works or trying to write an interesting data journalism story, you're asking causal questions, not predictive questions. And you need different tools. So let's say there's a relationship between thing X and thing Y, and we want to write a story about that. Um, most of you have probably heard, you have to check for additional variables. This is why correlation is not causation. Um, there's lots of other things external to X and Y that can be causing that relationship between X and Y. So for example, we might have thing Z. And you've probably heard, you know, you need to control for things. If you're going to do statistics, you need to put control variables or confounders <laughs> into uh, your model. And so this is what a confounder model looks like. We have thing X and Y that have a relationship. And then we also have uh, thing Z, which is influencing both thing X and thing Y. So when thing X, when thing Z changes, both X and Y also change. So that's why you need to put Z or a control variable or a lurking variable or a hidden variable into your model if you want to tell the truth with statistics. However, there's another role that thing Z might be playing. Thing Z might be a mediator. See how the arrows go in the different direction? So in the mediator model, when thing X changes, thing Z changes, and then thing Y changes. And if you include Z as a mediator in your model, your model is not answering the question that you think it is. You're no longer talking about the relationship between X and Y if you've included Z in the model. So usually, if you're doing prediction, you want to put as many things as you can find in that model. But if you're doing a causal analysis, you need to be really careful and thoughtful about whether you're going to put Z 
that, that third variable or fourth or fifth into your model. One example of this that I worked on was a cash transfer program to young mothers that was designed to help reduce the um, prevalence of low birth, birth weight babies. So we had cash transfer going directly to the mothers, low birth weight babies is thing Y. However, some of the mothers, but not all of the mothers, used some of the cash to change the way that they ate. And the way that they ate changed the prevalence of low birth weight babies. So this is the results, time one, two, and three. If we tried to see if that project worked with Z in the model. So this is me controlling for the nutrition that the mother ate at all three times. This is whether or not our program worked. This is me not controlling for the change in nutrition, whether or not the program worked. These are them together. And so the top one is answering the question, if we don't care about the nutritional changes of the mother, does our program work? And the bottom one, if we um, don't control for the nutritional changes in the mother, does the program work? Again, both of these lines are correct. They just answer really different questions. And, they, and the answers to the questions are very different, whether or not you're gonna fund this program, whether or not you're gonna um, design a law that implements this program, really, really matters. So now that we've talked a little bit about deciding whether or not to include a third variable in your model, we're gonna talk about some of the things that can happen when you do include a third variable in your model. Simpson's paradox is something that you're probably already familiar with. And uh, I was working, I live in Toronto, and I was working with a small community in Ontario that was having a youth mental health crisis. They had a small amount of money, and they needed to figure out what they were going to do with the money available. So we had data from this country, this community, and we had a nonprofit group that was very focused on racial inequity. And when they divided the data, it was very clear that black youth were at much more risk than the white youth in the community. There was another, also a nonprofit group, same data, but uh, the, they were funded by a gender equity uh, grant, so they divided the data by uh, gender. And they found out that the male youth in the same community were much more at risk. Finally, uh, the local government wanted to look at the data by poverty, and they found that, it, they found that the youth not in poverty were the most at risk. So we had to figure out what to do with the money. And what we did was we put all the data together in one multivariate model. So we, we looked not just at the youth's uh, skin color or poverty status or gender, but we looked at all three of those things at the same time. And we went from seeing that black children, male children, and children not in poverty were at risk to seeing that it was actually the white males in poverty that were the most at risk in this community. So this is called Simpson's Paradox. And um, so we went from black, male, and not poor to white, male, and poor. And again, none of these things are incorrect. They answer different questions. And so Simpson's Paradox is an example of the, the variables that you're including in your model are telling your data what to say. We often like to think that we're allowing the data to speak but mostly we're telling the data what to say by the way we visualize it, by the variables that we do or don't include in the model. And so that's why we have to be really, really specific about what question we're trying to answer. Final thing we'll talk about is called the prosecutor's fallacy. And um, As Lynn mentioned, I, I do a lot of human rights work and a lot of children's rights work, and this is the one that keeps me up at night. Uh, I'm gonna start with a very, very heartbreaking story that uh, emphasizes why we really need to think carefully about what question we're answering. Sally Clark uh, is a British woman who had a son born in 1996, and he died when he was eight weeks old. 
They weren't quite sure why he died. Um, the autopsy was inconclusive. A year later, she had a second son named Harry, and when he was about eight weeks old, he also died. Um, the postmortem was inconclusive for the second son, but um, it, it raised suspicion. She had two sons die at eight weeks within the course of two years, and she was charged with murder and went uh, to court. Now, the prosecutor in her case used research, very good research, that showed that the odds of a SIDS death, so SIDS is sudden infant death syndrome, uh, SIDS death is a death of a baby that usually cannot be conclusively um, identified in an autopsy. So the odds of a SIDS death in a healthy, high-income British family is about 1 in 850. 8,500. <laughs> so then the prosecutor multiplied 1 in 8,500 by 1 in 8,500 and came up with the figure uh, one in 73 million. Now there's a little bit of problems there, but we're not gonna focus on that for this talk. <laughs> but yes, that is problematic. But let's just give him the benefit of the doubt on that one. Um, so the prosecutor said there was a one in 73 million chance that these two babies had died naturally. And very, very sadly, the jury agreed and they convicted her. However, this is the incorrect question. So the P with the parentheses E and I is a mathematical way of writing what's the probability of the evidence given innocence. So the prosecutor was purporting to answer the question, what's the probability that two unexplained deaths would happen to somebody who's innocent? And you can see right away from the bar chart that that's that's not even including the right pieces of the bar chart. That's only including the gray and the red pieces of that bar chart. It leaves off the, the yellow, which is what he actually was trying to talk about, whether she murdered those babies. The correct question is, what's the probability of innocence given the evidence? The evidence is the thing we have. There's two unexplained infant deaths. We're trying to figure out what's the probability that Sally Clark is innocent. So there's two types of mothers in this scenario. There's innocent mothers and guilty. And innocent mothers have some babies that die from SIDS and some babies that die from other natural causes. And the guilty mothers, all their babies have all died from murder because that's the definition of, in this instance, the guilt. So to answer this question, we need to take different parts of the colored bar charts and the prosecutor was taking. We need to find the probability of innocence given two infant deaths of an unknown cause. When we do that math, there's a two in three probability that Sally Clark is innocent. So that is a very, very big difference. Um, and of course, there was a great outcry from the mathematical community during the Sally Clark trial, but unfortunately it took so long to get it retried that um, essentially Sally Clark killed herself. So this, this matters. Um, and it's not just important in courtrooms. I know very few of you are actually um, probably crime reporters or <laughs> crime visualizers, although it did make, uh, make an appearance both in the O.J. Simpson case. And also, if you're a fan of the podcast Serial, uh, Julie Schneider in there uh, gives us a lovely example of the prosecutor's fallacy when talking about whether or not um, Adnan did it. Um, however, really what this is an example of conditional probability. Conditional probability is not intuitive. It's, it's complicated to work about, with and very complicated to visualize. So for example, um, if, you, if you're doing a story about death or working with the government, trying to get them to understand the death rates, uh, there are very different results. There just was a, an article uh, in one of the US papers that visualized, um, given a successful suicide, what is the percent What's the probability that you used a certain method? What's the probability that you used a gun versus poison? However, that was the question on the headline. However, the visualization that they had was, given an attempted suicide with a certain method, what was the probability of success? So you're gonna get really different answers. And if you're trying to make a policy about uh, violence or gun violence, or if you're a person trying to decide what to do, 
those questions are not the same. The probability of A given B is not the probability of B given A. Um, it's also important in the climate change, ecology sector, um, when we're trying to study uh, wetlands, so a certain percentage of wetlands are dying because of climate change, and we're trying to figure out why. Um, unfortunately, most of the time, the things we can study are the wetlands that are already dead. So that's a lot like Sally Clark's case, in that we're studying the wetlands that are already dead and trying to figure out what predicts their death. So we're studying predictors given death, which isn't really an answer to the same question of, given the predictors, what's the probability of death? But sometimes it's the best. You just have to work with the data you have, make the assumptions that you have to make. And when you're communicating it, make sure that you say, this is the question that I'm answering. Um, in health, again, the chances of having a heart attack given high cholesterol are not the same as high cholesterol given a heart attack. But it's a lot easier to study the second of those things than it is the first. And if you're translating science for the public, which I know uh, it were fantastic, data visualizers spend a lot of time translating science for public consumption or for policymaker consumption, um, scientists are usually very careful in their peer-reviewed journal articles, which, you know, take a long time to read and can't effectively be communicated in many instances. They're very careful to couch their findings in a lot of scientific caveats, which are easy to lose when you need to make a headline that somebody's gonna click on. Uh, and so these are some examples of why those scientific caveats really do matter. And you can't just say, this question is close enough to the other questions, because you're gonna accidentally be telling a lie, which I have learned the hard way many times. So I've talked about four key fallacies and how they answer slightly different questions. So the ecological fallacy uh, answers a question about a different level of the population than, than the data that you have. The causal fallacy in, includes variables that probably shouldn't be included. If it's a mediator, you should not include it unless you're gonna be very specific about the fact that you included a mediator. Including or excluding variables changes the question, fundamentally changes the question that you're answering. Since this paradox is once you've decided to include three or four or five different variables, you need to be very careful and take some time to look through how your results change when you put some of those variables in or out because the changes can be dramatic and hidden. And finally, prosecutor's fallacy. If you're gonna use conditional probability, maybe do it a couple of times and write the story or do the viz a couple of times because conditional probability is confusing and not intuitive, um, but it's important that you condition on the item that you have the evidence about, innocence given evidence. And you can find me online. Um, I live in Canada. I'm very, very, very grateful to the data viz world. Um, you help um, people like me who are not professional data viz people find ways to effectively communicate what it is we wanna say. And thank you so much for having me. Thank you.